the Never Trump case against impeaching the president. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, our buddy David Brooks over at the New York Times, the so-called- <laughs> Well, just hold it right there, mister. <laughs> We're going to put quotation marks around that one, lest anyone uh, possibly take you seriously. Okay. Our buddy David Brooks over at the New York <laughs> Times <laughs> has written a column where he's basically saying that uh, President Trump is guilty of what the Democrats say that he's guilty of in regard to this uh, situation with Ukraine. However, it would be a bad idea for them to pursue impeachment. Um, he makes a, a variety of points, uh, but one of them, Bill, seemed to fall into uh, harmony with what you were saying. Uh, I believe it was yesterday's episode of Bill Whittle Now. He said, look, if you impeach President Trump, you're just playing into his hands. Well, what on earth would we do without conservatives like uh, like our, our our trusty friend there, huh? So it, I mean, it, it, I mean, the conservative movement would wither and die without the kind of um, without the kind of commitment to core principles that uh, that David Brooks shows. Well, let me just say, Bill, that um, one of the cases he makes is that if you don't impeach him and if you just let the electorate uh, decide whether they like this kind of behavior, that you're more likely to remove him from office and therefore save the conservative movement. Mm. Of which he is a champion, I might say. It is Brooks who said that the thing he liked most about Barack Obama was his finely creased pants. Wasn't that David Brooks? I, I do not have any quotes about haberdashery. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was he who said, uh, uh, yeah, Obama is fantastic. He's crazy. He came out, his, his slacks were perfectly creased. Um, so uh, It was something about his, the cut of the jib and the crease of so his I, pants or something. Uh, tell me, who's that goat-legged fellow smooth? I like the cut of his jib. Uh, <laughs> but my point is, is that, um, is that for, for a guy like this to call himself a conservative is just a form of, of increasing his um, moral statue – <laughs> stature, his moral and his moral stature, his moral stature among the left. He's one of these guys who says, listen, I'm against Donald Trump and I'm against everything the conservatives stand for. And I'm a conservative. Wow. Okay, then. Well, all right. He's nothing like a conservative. For him to say Donald Trump is guilty of the things that he's been accused of, but shouldn't be impeached is basically the thrust of his message. The thrust of his message is Donald Trump is guilty of impeachable crimes. And, uh, as we get a little deeper into this thing, uh, unless I'm missing something, um, the impeachable crime is he says, hey, do me a favor. Can you look into something that the Ukrainian president had already raised in terms of corruption? And and this point needs to be said as often as possible, So, because this is the thing I, I just am not hearing here. There is an enormous difference between a president saying to another president. Uh, uh, head of another foreign power saying, hey, do me a favor, look into this alleged wrongdoing versus, hey, do me a favor, make sure nobody looks into this alleged wrongdoing. Can those of you at home see the difference? Well, Bill, um, I, I think that there's more, you have more in common with David Brooks at the New York Times than you're acknowledging at this point. Stop uh, because clock, he is Scott, saying, yeah. the thrust of it is, he's saying um, that impeachment is not the right mechanism for this. Let the guy lose legitimately. Now, you said yesterday, no, I'm not, you I'm said not yesterday that President Trump is virtually guaranteed re-election if the Democrats pursue this impeachment path. Yes, but that just means that Brooks and I have come to the same conclusion based on entirely different premises. Brooks is convinced he's, he's um, guilty of impeachable offenses. I think the idea is preposterous, utterly preposterous. Well, regard, he's, let's just say regardless of what Brooks thinks that President Trump did, mm -hmm. his statement that he thinks that impeachment is the wrong way to go about it would seem to line up with what you said, which is if you're a Democrat, you should avoid impeachment at all costs because it is the biggest gift Nancy Pelosi could possibly give to President Trump. Yeah, on balance, I think the best way I can describe what I perceive to be democratic uh, motivations here is that is that they are uh, uh, they're like a a coke addict that is so hooked and needs and needs the next hit so badly that they're really that they're willing to steal coke from the dealer. Uh, you know what I mean? In other words, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience in that area. Could you uh, elucidate? Sure. Let me just look back on all the years I, I dealt cocaine back in Florida <laughs> to see if it all comes back to me. Um, what I'm saying is this: they have made 
they have made, whether they wanted to or not, it's, I think it's pretty much already done. They have made a bargain with themselves. And it is an exceedingly childlike bargain, and this is why they're progressives. And I think that the general dynamic is something like this. We viscerally hate Donald Trump so much <clears throat> that we would rather put the asterisks of impeached against his name. And let's be clear on this. He's not being removed from office under any circumstances. But we would rather put that. We'd rather get the tarred brush and put that <clears throat> impeached on him and lose than to, than to just simply have the discipline to go ahead and try to beat him. I think, I think their hatred for him has become so pathological that the chance to strike because look, Scotty, this thing, this thing with the Ukraine thing is so absurd. This is an excuse. This is an excuse that they've been waiting for. And so now they're going to use this excuse to, uh, to move for, uh, uh, at least an investigation into impeachment as a means of further selling Donald, Donald Trump's reputation and, and at no gain, except for the childish emotional game of saying, well, even though we, we uh, didn't actually have him removed from office, and even though this action cost us another four years of Donald Trump, at least we got to say, you know, we brought impeachment charges against him. This is how four-year-olds deal with things. It's this immediate gratification thing. And, and, and it's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Well, Bill, you're, you seem to once again align yourself with David Brooks without intending to do so because no, sheer Brooks, coincidence, is, Scott. Brooks is essentially saying, look, you cannot win this vote in the Senate. When it goes, when the impeachment articles go to trial in the Senate, right. the Republican, like 20 Republican votes are necessary and you can't get 20 Republican votes. And let me quote from Brooks here. He's saying, usually when a leader takes a big risk, that's can I, because- Can I interrupt you for one second? I'm please sorry, do. this is genuine, genuine uh, mis, uh, just me lacking information. When you say they need 20 Republican votes, is that in the House to... to no, that's in, to, the, in the Senate to convict. To, to convict, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so he says, usually when a leader takes a big risk, it's because there's a big upside. But Nancy Pelosi is taking a giant risk and there's little upside. At the end of this process, Trump will probably be acquitted by the Senate. He will declare himself vindicated and victorious in his battle against the swamp. And an ugly backlash could ensue in both parties. And by both parties, he basically means, you know, the, the Democrats will be angry at their own people. And then there's a, a whole bunch of Republicans who will say, you know, why did we go th through this process like this when, uh, you know, it's tearing the party apart? Uh, he's come to the correct conclusion, again, based on the wrong premise. He thinks that Trump is guilty. I think, I think my theory is much stronger. I just don't think he's connected the dots the way that I have. He cannot understand why Nancy Pelosi is doing this. He's come out and said, I don't understand why Nancy Pelosi is doing this. And I understand why Nancy Pelosi is doing this. And Nancy Pelosi is doing this because she's got a base that is so filled with hatred and, and just this ravenous appetite for anything anti-Trump that to, that to go down a road that's even neutral is suicide for her. I think Nancy Pelosi got a pretty good idea that they're not going to win this presidential election in 2020. And I think she's kind of in a, in a, in between a rock and a hard place where she's determining how much of this red meat I want to throw out there without utterly sinking our chances. And at the same time, I've got to keep the, the, the social justice far left progressive wing motivated and active or else we don't even get through the primaries. So she's in a tough position. Couldn't happen to a nicer person, by the way. But that, but this, I think this whole thing, Scott, utterly defies rational analysis because it's coming from progressives and rationality is not their strong suit. This is an emotional spur of the moment. Crime of passion is what it is. Well, it sounds and, like you're saying that uh, with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, that um, her strategy here is in line with that good old fashioned American value that when it comes to impeachment, it's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. I am still... I am still quite convinced that Nancy Pelosi's actual strategy is to let this thing really boil, get as much anti-Trump hatred as you possibly can out of your base, keep your base fired up, and then let the thing just slowly kind of die. In other words, she's going to ride a little, um, she's going to ride the, the froth of, of anti-impeachment hatred right now, but... I think she's going to have the the because she is a disciplined person and she does she doesn't she's just a, a political machine, so I think she's actually going to let it die. So you um, think that and Pelosi thinks that there's no there there. In other words, that there's not yes, even enough there absolutely. to get articles of impeachment through the House. Correct. I think Plant, Nancy Pelosi knows there's no there there. She knew there was no there there with Mueller. She knows that there's no there here either. 
so she's in a pickle. All of a sudden, uh, the base and and the and the uh, the raving lunatics. Who who just anything? Donald Trump did what? He he wore different cufflinks. Isn't that a, that's a that's an impeachable offense? Surely, those people saw this Ukrainian thing as an example to to just okay. Here's the here's the moment we've always waited for. Here's another opportunity to impeach Trump. And this thing blew up so fast and so powerfully that she could not stand against that wave. She had to surf it, and and that's what I think she's doing. And I think that's why she's actually going to let this thing just and and count on what. Progressives have always counted on, which is the inability of the American people to remember any particular subject for more than a week. So, Bill, uh, let, me, and, let me tell you another thing yep. that David Brooks says about this situation. Basically, he says that Democrat presidential candidates are upset about the whole thing because they want to talk about policy. He says when he went on the road with some Democrat uh, candidates in uh, Waco, Texas, in Nantucket, in Kansas City, that um, people were asking questions about policy issues related to health care, jobs, climate change, et cetera, and that only one person even mentioned uh, the impeachment, and that was a fellow journalist. And so basically, and here's the quote, Democrats are playing Trump's game. Trump has no policy agenda. He's incompetent in improving the lives of American citizens, even his own voters, but he's good at one thing. Waging, Did he say- wait, Hang on a second. Waging reality TV personality wars against coastal elites. And so, so now over the next few months, he gets to have a personality war against Nancy Pelosi and Gerald Nadler. Did this arch conservative say that Donald Trump is incapable of improving the lots of, of, of the Americans that voted for him? Is that what he said? I am incapable of improvising on the fly in a way that would make that sound like he did. Could, could, could you read the quote again? Yes. Uh, hang on a second. Let me get to that, Demo uh, that uh, paragraph, that Democratic paragraph. Um, he's incompetent at improving the lives of American citizens, Hold even it. his own voters. OK, well, that's going to come to new, as as remarkable news to the hundreds of millions of Americans who, who are doing better economically than they ever did under Barack Obama. It's gonna come as incredible news to the, to the number of unemployed blacks, which is slower than it's ever been in history, and Hispanics and all the rest of it. So for, for Brooks to make a statement like that, Brooks could, make, could have could theoretically made some kind of statement along the lines of, yes, Trump got a big economic gain, but it's a bubble, and when it collapses, it's gonna be even worse. He could have said something like that, which wouldn't have been true. But for him to say that Donald Trump is, is not only incapable of, he's in competent. He's not capable of improving the lives of Americans after watching the economic growth that we've had during the last two and a half years tells me that that David Brooks as the voice of conservatism might be under, I don't know, Scott, let, can, can we say such a thing that the clouds of suspicion may be beginning to gather over the blinding conservative light that David Brooks illuminates us with every week, I find that hard to believe. Well, but, Bill, here's but one thing. Let's just make one this thing case from your too. perspective. And frankly, from most viewers of this, shouldn't you go by the old dictum that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and say, look, I disagree with a lot of things that David Brooks says. I, you know, I don't like the fact that he's a so-called never Trumper. I don't like the fact that he thinks that America is not getting better under the Trump administration. However, he's on the team that says it's a bad idea to impeach Trump. So why don't we embrace him on that. Well, I'm glad you brought that expression up. Because the enemy of my enemy is my friend is just plain, it's, an, it's, it's just silly. It's wrong. What, what that means is, what the, what the person is trying to say is the enemy of my enemy is an enemy that can cooperate with me for this short-term goal. Your enemy of your enemy never becomes your friend. And if, and if you actually think that that's the case, then you are naive beyond beyond rescue. On a strictly utilitarian basis, uh, I'm not no, saying Scotty, friend I'm, like you're going to no, no, you know, no, 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 befriend I each other on Facebook. No, 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 no. I understand that. But 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 my point is this expression, I'm not, I'm not coming down on you for using the expression because people use it all the time. But as it turns out, the inaccuracies in that expression accurate, actually show us what our attitude should be. So if you're saying that the, that we need to go along with Brooks because he he is the enemy of my enemy, therefore he's my friend, no, we just have common enemies and maybe we can work together. But David Brooks and I are always going to be enemies when it comes to this idea that conservatism is a, is a something that's discussed down at the country club, you know, while you're waiting for your for your club sandwich and, and then going to take a little uh, you know, a little expeditionary cruise out on um, out on the Chesapeake uh, in your yacht. Th that's that's the creased pants conservatism of, of David Brooks. And it's not conservatism. It's not a, a person who said it, it's not even. If somebody says that Donald Trump is incapable of making the country better, 
then that guy's not even not a conservative. He's not really a serious commentator because that comment is so blatantly, obviously mistaken. You can hate Trump and you can hate his policies and you can think that this whole thing is just a a chimera of some kind. But to say that it didn't exist is to essentially say, I'm... I have no idea what's going on, but I'm going to say it with authority. But you would be okay personally and also with hearing the president basically say, look, under the big tent of people who think it's a bad idea to impeach President Trump, we welcome the never Trumpers. I don't see how Donald Trump welcoming never Trumpers is going to increase the number of Trump supporters who used to be never Trumpers. Even the, people other who, words, even the people who don't like me, the president might say, think that this whole thing is a scam. Now that he can say. Right. Or at least a bad idea. Right. I would have gone with scam. And I think I think uh, if, if this kind of opportunity comes up, and I'm sure it will, I'm sure those are the kind of terms President Trump will use. He will use terms like witch hunt and scam and farce and political theater uh, for the remarkably good reason that all of those terms happen to be true. Well, David Brooks could also be seen as the undercover editorialist at the New York Times who realizes that he only has a little sliver of daylight through which he might pass to get to the minds and hearts of the readers of the New York Times and frankly, to get past the gauntlet of, you know, the many levels of editors who would screen everything out. And so maybe he's just a, a true blooded conservative who's looking at this and saying, okay, this much I know I can drive a wedge. I can get in there and I can say it's a bad idea to impeach President Trump. Well, we remember a couple weeks ago when Donald Trump made a speech and uh, and the New York Times accidentally reported that the president talks about healing and um, and uh, and and the dangers of racism and that numbers, huge numbers of New York Times supporters um, canceled their subscriptions, not because they wrote a glowing article about Trump, but because they wrote one that wasn't nonstop negative. So I can actually answer this question for you very, very simply, uh, Scott. And I think I think for those of you at home, you could probably write this one down on a, on a piece of paper because I think this is a truism. If you are a conservative and you're writing for the New York Times, you're not a conservative. Now, Bill, because a real cons- I a think real conservative. you as a public speaker would stand before any audience that would have you, especially an audience of progressives, to be able to explain your views and to try to reach out and make a connection with some people who so far have only a caricature of conservatism, wouldn't you? <clears throat> of course I would, but the, but, but the Times would never hire me. The Times would never hire me because if the Times hired me, using the example you gave of being willing to stand in front of a hostile audience, if the Times hired me, then I would start to convert progressives through the Times. And so the Times can't afford to hire me. So what they do is they look for somebody who is on board with them all the time. Donald Trump is incompetent. Donald Trump can't do a good thing for this country. Donald Trump is guilty of these impeachable fines. And they say he's a conservative. And everybody goes, well, yes, he's a conservative. There's no evidence that David Brooks is a conservative. Anybody who says President Obama should be admired because a very sharp crease in his pants is exactly the kind of C. Montgomery Burns kind of Republican who sits at the Yacht Club and, 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 and talks with fellow Democrats about the great unwashed and how the regular people out in this country just simply don't have a clue, the poor dears. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sold. Your, your argument is null because you're saying that, the New, that if I had a chance to write for the New York Times, I could reach people. And I agree. If, if the New York Times offered me a chance to write for them, I'd leap at it. But they never would. And the reason they never would is because if I wrote for the New York Times, I don't invent any of this. It's not billism. It's not anything. I just look around and see it. I know it. I understand it. And I believe it. So if they were to hire me, they would get actual real conservatism. And that would either cause people to cancel their remaining subscriptions because some of those people would start to change their mind. So what they have to do is they have to hire a progressive call him a conservative, and then have him print an article in the New York Times saying, as a conservative, uh, needless to say, I agree Trump is guilty of impeachment. That goes without saying. But as the conservative voice of the uh, New York Times, and and uh, Jack, I'll see you at the cocktail party as soon as we're done with this little adventure, uh, I am uh, saying that I don't know if this is tactically a very good idea. Now, of course, he deserves to be impeached, needless to say, but um, I don't know. Uh, 
As a staunch conservative who agrees that Donald Trump is 100% guilty of everything that he's been accused of and who is incapable of improving lives of American citizens, like all conservatives believe, uh, I, I think impeachment might be a, a, a poor choice to make sure that we, I mean, that they win in, uh, in uh, 2020. Go away, David. Well, folks, this process of uh, an inquiry into articles of impeachment and the whole uh, hubbub that the Democrats have surrounded President Trump with is continuing and picking up speed. And five times a week, Bill Whittle will be here to uh, weigh in with his comments that are anchored in conservative philosophy, time-tested principles. Uh, we're not always going to talk about the Trump impeachment thing. There are other things in but the news. Or let me say it this way, Bill, there will eventually be other things in the news. <laughs> But right now, it's a it's a bit of a struggle to find anything else. Uh, but in any case, we are grateful to the members at BillWhittle.com who make it possible for us to have these conversations to present what have become um, somewhat alternative, marginal, fringe views. And that is that the Constitution should be respected and that people should act with integrity and that you shouldn't use tools like impeachment for just uh, political purposes, uh, purely political purposes. But in any case, if you're one of those members who's supporting us, we thank you for that. Um, if you have not yet joined this cadre of devoted Americans, we invite you to do so. Go to BillWhittle.com and click that Become a Member link. For Bill Whittle, you may, please. I just want to add one thing. If you're one of those conservatives out there who's watching this, because the number of people who watch this is far, far greater than the number of members we have. But if you're one of those people like every other actual conservative that I've met who is white, hot, furious, incandescent rage at what's going on, you have to be willing to put your money where your mouth is and support the channels that are providing you with not only an analysis of what's happening, but the ammunition for the defense. You know, this is this is why we're here. If the media wasn't this assassination branch, I would be doing something else. And so would Scott. We'd both be working in a furniture store. Uh, and and we, we need to do this because it's important. So if this has made you angry, then do something about it. Thank you to the members of BillWhittle.com for making this possible. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott.